quadratic forms over uh, semi-local rings. Uh, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to talk in the seminar. The seminar has been, uh, in a sense, a lifesaver for me uh, in the during this pandemic. So I really enjoyed it, and I appreciate that I have the opportunity to talk here. So what I will be talking uh, is based on joint work with uh, Philip Schill. There is something which I have to do. Okay. Got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's based on joint work with Philip Schill. So one article which uh, I have uh, already written down here will appear in, in the in the journal Indicaciones uh, in the volume for Springer, uh, in honor of his tenth uh, tenth anniversary of his death, and there is a follow-up uh, article or in or big notes uh, which are in preparation. So um, let me start with introducing some terminology. So throughout this talk, I will consider everything over a base ring R. And I will not assume that two is invertible. In a sense, this is the whole point of this talk because essentially everything what I'm saying will be is known for, if you consider fields or quadratic forms over fields of characteristic not two. I will consider M throughout M will be a faceful finite projective module. Not necessarily of constant rank. And I will denote by Q a quadratic form. And so it has a polar form, which I will denote by BQ. So it is a symmetric bilinear form, which defined by saying BQ of M1, M2, so it should be Q of M1 plus M2 minus Q of M1 minus Q of M2. Okay, now I will denote by our elk the category of unital and associative and commutative R algebras. And <clears throat> if you have an S in our arc and our ring, then you can frame the base change. So we have a quadratic form QS, which goes from MS, which is M tensor over R S into S. And it's uniquely determined by requiring that QS of M tensor S should be Q of M times S squared. Okay. Now, the first class of quadratic forms I will be using, not so much, a little bit rather, is the following. Namely, I will say that Q is a regular quadratic form. Yeah. If and only if the adjoint PQ star, which goes from M to M star and which sends an M into BQ of M, then considered as a linear form, this adjoint is 
invertebra. It's an isomorphism of R modules. Let me give you an example. So suppose your M is free. Say you would have a basis E1 up to EN. You can then form the matrix or, uh, given by the polar. And it follows that Q is regular if and only if B, the matrix whose entries are B, Q, E, I, E, J, this matrix is invertible. Okay. Now, if two R is zero, right? Then this matrix is alternating. And now it's a well known fact that invertible alternate, alternating matrices only exist if their rank is even. Therefore, if in this situation, if your Q is regular, it follows that N must be even. So this is of course unfortunate because you see there are some standard quadratic form which you would cover with your theory, which, which you would like to cover with your theory, namely, what I call the split quadratic form. So let me define that. Right, so they come in two types, namely there is Q zero of two M, which is defined on the free R module of rank 2M, and which is simply the standard hyperbolic form. So it sends R minus M up to R minus one, and then R, R1 up to Rm. It sends this to the sum I from one to M of R minus I times Ri. And then there is the split quadratic form of odd rank, which goes from R 2M plus one to R, and it sends R minus M up to R minus one, and then we add one coordinate R zero, R one up to R M, and it sends this to R zero squared, plus the sum i from one to m of r i r minus i. So you see this, the first part of this q zero to m, this is a regular form, but this, the odd uh, split quadratic form is not regular if two is not invertible. And so you want to have a theory which uh, incorporates these split quadratic forms independent of R. And such a theory exists. And so let me now introduce this concept. So um, I need also first to remind you what is the radical of a quadratic form. So it is by definition, all the M in M such that QM is zero and also 
VQ of M, comma M is zero. So it's a submodule of um, of the radical of your of your um, of the polar form. So here now my basic definition is the following. I will call Q non-singular if and only if the following holds. Now, you could be tempted to say, well, it's radical should be zero, but this is not a good idea because the radical of quadratic form is not very well behaved. However, we can do this as follows. We require that this radical is zero for all fields, F in the category of um, R algebras. And now I will give you some more equivalences just to tell you that this is in fact a very good notion. First of all, um, it is equivalent or stable under localization. Namely, if you take the base chains of Q to any local ring or P, then this is non-singular. So for all P in spec R. Of course, I should have said first that once you start with a non-singular form, it stays non-singular in all base ring extensions. So the point is going back. It's also stable under going to the residue fields. R mod M is non-singular. For every maximal ideal M of R. And a, you can <clears throat> come back if you know that this is non-singular for some phase fully flat extension. QS non-singular for some faithfully flat S in R hat. And it does what we require to do, namely it incorporates the split quadratic forms in the following sense. Namely, it's equivalent. Q is non singular if and only if there exists a flat cover R1 up to Rn such that, well, if you base change your M to Ri, then this is free. And <clears throat> the base change of the quadratic form to Ri is split. So it is one of the split quadratic forms, which we have uh, defined before. Um, so it does essentially all what you would like to have for a quadratic form if you want to do using techniques from algebraic geometry. But let me give you more conditions so that you see that this is really a good concept. So suppose that the rank of M is at least two for all P in spec R, then um, the condition is equivalent to saying that the Clifford algebra of Q is a separable algebra. It's also equivalent to saying that if you look at the quadric associated 
this Q. Then in general, for any quadratic form, this will be a projective um, R scheme, but in, it's non-singular if and only if that this quadratic is smooth. Uh, this concept of calling of non-singularity is something which uh, appears of in, in the rank uh, in the literature and I will discuss it later on. So, but let me add here another condition. So if M is uh, free of rank N, then non-singularity means the following. Okay. Um, it means it's equivalent to saying that if n is even, well, then your q is regular as I defined before. And if n is odd, then this means that the q is what some people call semi-regular. I don't want to go into detail has to do with the fact that you can define a half discriminant in the in the in the odd case. So this you know you can see this in the book by Knes and book by Knus or Knaser. So finally if your base ring R is a field then non-singularity means the following. It means that, well, you can have two situations, namely the characteristic of R is not two, or the dimension of M is even. And in this case, it means just that Q is regular as before, or while the alternative is that the characteristic of R is two and the dimension of M is odd. And in this case, non-singularity means that if you look at the radical of the polar form, meaning all the M in M, such that BQ of, if this is zero, this is a one dimensional space. And if you evaluate the form on this radical, it is non-zero. Okay, so this, hopefully convinces you that um, looking at this type of quadratic forms is, um, uh, is a good enterprise. But uh, let me tell you a little bit about the terminology. Um, you perhaps are surprised that we call this non-singular. Uh, it turns out that this type of quadratic forms has been looked at before, uh, but with many different names. So here is a short rundown, what other uh, names have, has, have been used in the literature. So non-singular forms are called um, non-degenerate, in the, by Conrad, they're called non-degenerate in the book EKM by Elman Karpenkov Merkuriev, and they're called non-degenerate in the book by, of the involutions by Knus, Merkuriev, Vost, and Tignol. They're called ordinary forms, by Deling, 
in SGA7, they're called separable quadratic forms by Lewis in some of his papers on quadratic forms. So our terminology is where uh, our terminology of calling them non-singular forms follows a paper of Swan on the K theory of um, hyperplanes, I think. So any case, um, this is what we have decided to call them. Okay, so I hope I have convinced you that non-singular quadratic forms are a good object to look at. So let me now give you some results which Philip and I proved. So from now on, I will assume that R is semi-local. And I will always assume without saying it that Q from M to R is non-singular. Um, so the first theorem I will consider, I will look at, is a, is a theorem which one could call Springer's theorem. Well, in the version which Philip and I proved. And in this version, it looks, it's stated as follows. So suppose you have an S, so suppose you have an S, which is in your R edge, which is finite and has constant odd, that's important, odd rank. <clears throat> and it's etal or it is one generated which means that your S is just a quotient of polynomial ring modulo a monic polynomial. Then the following is true. Um, if you base change your quadratic form QS and to go up to S, suppose it's isotropic. Well, then it is already isotropic to start with. So isotropic here means that you have an M in M, which is unimodular, meaning that the line through M is free of rank one and it's complemented. And the quadratic form is vanishes on M. Okay. Now it is called Springer's theorem because of good reason or perhaps not of good reason. So let me give you some remarks on what has been known previously. Well, it's called Springer's theorem because Springer published a paper in 1952, and he proved this result in the setting that S over R as a field extension and the characteristic of R is not two. 
Uh, in fact, one should say that apparently this result is a conjecture of wit and it was proven by Artin, but Artin didn't publish it. And so it's now called Springer's theorem. Um, it is an important theorem, important that uh, you can find it in any, in any book on quadratic forms over rings. So for example, it is in the book by Elman Korpenkov and Markuyev and any in their book, they prove it for any field. R, again, S over R are field extensions. And then later on, there have been extensions to the following setting. So there's a paper by Panin and Weyman in 2008, and Panin, a follow up paper by Panin and Pimenyov in 2010. And they look at the case where R is a local ring. And um, they assumed that the residue field is infinite uh, and as etal and two lies in, is invertible. Okay. Uh, now, Philip and I came to this result or to this topic when we were looking um, at another topic which goes back to Springer, namely um, so-called twisted, twisted composition algebras. And in, then, in that concept, you need an Springer's result arbitrary or close to arbitrary or similar. So let me give you um, sort of a little overview about how to prove Springer's theorem in the generality which is which I stated here. Now you may wonder um, why there are two cases, namely the etal case and the one generated case. This has to do with the way Springer's theorem is proven over fields. Namely, there is a relatively easy reduction of Springer's theorem to the case where the base field is, uh, is a simple extension, where the base, and then once you have a simple extension, then uh, it's a little bit more complicated to prove Springer's theorem there. And so it's therefore not surprising that you prove, you can prove this uh, Springer's result in two different settings. So here is then a short summary of the proof. Well, uh, first of all, it's relatively easy and standard to reduce to the case where M is, has constant rank. And because um, any um, um, isotropic vector embeds in a hyperbolic plane, then its rank, you can assume it's a at least two. Now, let me give you the proof at least for the rank two case. I like it. Rank two. In fact, in this case, it Springer's theorem holds um, in a little bit more generality, namely, you it holds for any finite projective S, which has odd degree. And it works as follows. So the idea is to look at the Clifford algebra of Q, right? So we know it is a set two graded algebra. 
And because of rank consideration, you can identify the odd part with M. Not only in terms of modules, but also there's relation how um, the quadratic form on M can be described in terms of the Clifford algebra. Well, um, it is known then that this is a quaternion algebra and the even part is a quadratic et al algebra. So if you go to MS phase change, then by assumption, this is isotropic, but it has rank two, so it's hyperbolic. So this Clifford algebra over S is split, right? Now, um, what we now have is the Clifford algebra of QS, which is the same as, or can be identified with the base change, right? So this is C0 of QS plus MS, right? So this is split, so therefore it follows that this is a split et al. Now, let me remind you that if you look at the automorphism group scheme of the quadratic et al algebra, then this is the constant group screen set mod two set. And now you can use a very general result, specialize a very general result in cohomology due to uh, essentially to what you do is uh, you specialize a result by the link on trace homomorphisms. It becomes the following. If you look at H1 of R into set mod two set, well, this embeds into H1 of S set mod two set because S over R is odd. And using this now, what we know is that the, after taking the base change, the even part is split and therefore it follows that already the even part over Q is split. So this is R cross I. Now I said this, the even part acts on M and um, using the relation between the norm of the even part and the quadratic form on M, it then follows easily that M is hyperbolic. So in particular, it is split. It is uh, isotropic. So this settles the rank two case, now the rank, higher rank. Well, um, the proof works as follows. Well, the channel outline at least. Um, you first prove this in the case where the S is one generated, meaning we call Rx over F. So F is odd and monic, say. And um, the idea then is to reduce the degree. And it's a little bit technical, so I don't want to go into detail. You reduce the degree obviously by two. And so eventually you come down that your degree of F is one and you're done. Now, let me talk about the Ita case. Well, in a sense, uh, this is sort of cheating. I mean, the real work actually lies in the 
um, one generated case. Because what you can do in the et al case is the following. You can use a result of uh, in a paper by, by a Flukinger first and Parimala, which gives you the following. Whenever you have an etal, and this has odd degree, well, you can embed this into a bigger T, which is uh, one generated. and has odd degree, right? And so what we do is, is obvious now, QUS is isotropic, though it follows that QT is isotropic, and so Q is isotropic. Okay. Now, there are some formal consequences from Springer's theorem, uh, which are conveniently summarized in a paper by Colliotelen. Namely, um, whenever you have an S in R out, and suppose you know that it satisfies Springer's theorem, it satisfies condition A without any condition on S. Suppose you know this somehow, QS isotropic implies Q isotropic. Well, then for this S, for this pair R and S and any non-singular quadratic form, you then have condition B which says, suppose QS is isometric to a second Q prime S, then this implies that Q is isometric to Q prime. So Q and Q prime, non-singular. Okay. So of course, in this seminar, it's obvious what this means. This means, of course, that if you look at H1 of R is the orthogonal group, then this embeds into H1 of S and the orthogonal group QS. Now there are other consequences, for example, implies um, that by the um, bit groups Q of as embed into the bit groups WQ of S. And in the sense it also implies, or it has consequences at least if S over R is uh, as in the spring of theorem, it implies uh, Charlotte's norm principle. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about Charlotte's norm principle. Okay, so what we need to know for Charlotte's norm principle is the following. Um, whenever you have a quadratic form, you can look at the similarity factors. So these are all U in R. 
such that Q is symmetric to U times, so R and R prime, U two times Q, right? So this is a subgroup of, or um, the group of, ele of invertible elements of R and uh, it always contains the squares, for example. But there are cases where it is equal to our all invertible elements, for example, in the hyperbolic case. Uh, now, Charles' norm principle says the following. And I should say a la, a la shil n. Okay. So, namely, suppose S is like in Springer's theorem. Uh, except that we can't do the one generated case. So let's suppose that R in our ALK is finite et al. of odd rank. Then you can look at the group of similarity factors up there in QS gives you some subgroup of the group of invertible elements of S. You can apply the norm to this group and it's contained in the similarity factors of Q. So this result, uh, well, it's called Charlotte's theorem because it was proven by Charlotte around 69. And um, Charlotte proved it where S over R is a field extension and characteristic not two, but it's also contained in the book by Elman, Karpenkov and Merkuriev for any field extension. And it was then extended um, by in the paper by Panin and Riemann um, in, uh, let me check where my notes, where it was, right? Um, I think it's 2008 and then Panin Pimenyov in 2010. And they looked at the case where um, R, I think uh, they looked at the case is a local domain. And uh, of course, two is invertible and uh, R over M is infinite. Okay. So to prove uh, Charlotte's principle in general, so what we do is we essentially follow the idea which, is, uh, which was already used in the paper by Panin and Riemann. Um, you reduce to the case that your form is um, regular and then 
in that case, you can use um, what is called transfer methods introduced by Charlau. And well, this will settle the case then. Okay. Now, let me move on to tell you a little bit about another result, which is in the same, um, which is closely related. Another known principle, known principle of Knebusch. So for that, I need um, to remind you of the following. So, okay, wait. So for any quadratic form, you can look at its set of values, P of Q, which is all the M in M. No, which is not all the M in M, wait. Which is just Q of M intersection is the invertible elements. All the invertible elements which are given by, uh, by your quadratic form. Now let me introduce the following notation. Q of M upper N in bracket is P of Q and then having n factors. Okay. So then Knebusch's norm principle states the following. Well, again, I should say, as proved in the notes by Philip and myself, it applies to S over R, any etal, finite etal, a uh, constant degree D. And it says the following. Well, so similar to this norm principle of Charlotte, we place the uh, similarity factors by the set of values, you look at D of QS. You apply the norm and what you get is, well, you may be tempted to write D of Q, but that's unfortunately not true. However, the following is true. You get this will lie in the union over all even n of d of q upper n. And let me call this the even part. This actually is a subgroup of the group of invertible elements. You get this if d is even. And you get n odd d of q n if d is odd. Now, in particular, independent of the parity of your quadratic of your d, you get always that apply the norm of the subgroup DQ of S even, then this always lies in DQ of the even part. OK. 
Okay. So, Knebus Norbert. Well, there have, of course, uh, there have been predecessors, previous, uh, and it was proven by Knebusch in 1971 uh, for S over R fields, field extension. And um, it was then proven in the paper by Oyan Guren, Panin, and somebody with the name Tsanulin in 2004. And then there is another paper which I should mention by Tsanulin. in 2000 and I think it's five, right? Now in their setup, always the R is semi-local, two is invertible and um, they have some more conditions which are I forget now. I think uh, they have an Ethereum domain. Okay. So, in essence, um, what we do is we can generalize this result uh, for arbitrary semi local rings. Uh, and the proof follows essentially. The ideas which were given in the paper by Oyangur and Panin and, and Tsanulin. So um, it's a little bit technical, so I don't want to say much about um, the proof itself. But let me then come to some of the consequences. Okay. So um, one of the consequences of both Springer theorem and Knebus norm principle is the following. Okay. So suppose and you have S over R et al. and of R degree. Q as usual non singular. Then you can look at group schemes, namely, you can look at G being the orthogonal group or the special orthogonal group or the spin group. Now, in our setting, it then follows that the canonical map from the flat cohomology of R for any three of these G embeds into H1 of S over G. This is injective. And the way this works is you prove star for G equals the orthogonal group. Well, this is essentially Springer. And now there's a channel principle which goes back to the paper of Coriotelen, which says once you have star for the orthogonal group, you then get star injectivity of the cohomology for 
the special orthogonal group. And once you have injectivity of the cohomology for the special orthogonal group, then essentially consequence of Knebusch's norm principle is then that you get star for the spin group. Let me finish by uh, telling you about another consequence. And this has to do with um, norm groups, eternal norm groups. So suppose X is an R scheme, then one can define the eternal norm groups group for X over I by saying it should be the subgroup generated by all the norms of the invertible elements of S, where S over R is finite et al. And X as an S point. Right. Now a corollary of what of this is the following. Suppose suppose um, well at, as before, R is semi-local, Q is non-singular. Suppose the rank of M is at least two. Now we take as X. In this case, we take the quadric associated with our Q. Then we have, can look at over this X, the entire norm group of Q. And lo and behold, it is equal to the group D of Q, the even part. Okay. So this generalizes the theorem of Koryotelen and Skoro Bogatov, who proved this for fields of characteristic not two. Our proof essentially is a little bit uh, roundabout, namely you prove first a uh, analogous result for the entire norm group of um, brower severi schemes. And then in the lowering case, one knows that power series schemes are actually the same as quadrix for low ranks and from, from there, you can go on. Okay, uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Erhard. Are there any questions? Yes, I think uh, I'm uh, Vanya Panin. May I ask a question? Please. Um, so, uh, questions, uh, my question sounds like this. Uh, suppose uh, S over R are a complete intersection. Uh, just do you think uh, that uh, Springer type theorem, yeah, of what degree? Uh, do you think that Springer type, uh, type theorem one should expect uh, in this context for this situation? Uh, my answer, my honest answer would be I'm afraid I have no idea. I have, um, um, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if, if this will be true for a complete intersection. What uh, uh, you and Philippe uh, proved, have proved uh, is uh, the case, uh, how to say, of 
uh, you have uh, in geometry terms, uh, you have base, you uh, multiply this base uh, uh, on a fine line, and then uh, take uh, a divisor given by a monic polynomial uh, on this uh, base cross uh, a fine line. This is clearly uh, a complete intersection case. And this is uh, one of the reasons why I asked my, my question, uh, but uh, a certain reason why uh, I'm very interested in this question uh, is due to uh, an old uh, conjecture of Kaliot uh, about, uh, about uh, uh, which uh, uh, of the following type. Uh, you have a regular local ring, you have a quadratic space over this ring, uh, and um, this quadratic space, uh, suppose this quadratic space is isotropic over the quash, over the fraction field, uh, then uh, by conje conjecture it is isotropic over uh, the ring itself. And uh, positive answer on my question uh, would give uh, some new results in this direction. Sure, right, okay. that I understand. That be because, but this is a general fact that whenever you have spring, the analog of Springer's theorem, whatever S and R are, then uh, this would give you something about cohomology, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Right, right. So, yeah. Exactly. But the point, <laughs> yeah, right. But the, the, the point is that Springer's theorem implies cohomology and you cannot come back, or right? it's not clear how to go back from mm -hmm. cohomology result to Springer's theorem. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah.